In the past year or so, we've all become used to AI-generated text and images and audio and increasingly also videos. There's been a lot of talk about how terrible this is for writers and artists and so on. But some computer scientists are warning that this AI creativity may soon collapse. Let's have a look. The problem is fairly easy to understand, but difficult to quantify. The AIs that we currently use are deep neural networks that are fed huge amounts of data and basically learn to recognize and reproduce patterns. Large language models recognize grammatical rules and words that belong to each other. Image creation software recognizes shapes and shadows and gradients. Video software recognizes moving shapes and their context and so on. But where does that data come from that they need to learn? Well, that was created by the original neural networks, humans. The issue is now that the more people use AIs to create new content, the higher the risk that future AIs will be fed data that they have produced themselves. And what will this do? It's not a priori all that obvious. You might think that with AI having a random element and sometimes being prone to generate nonsense, the result might be that it just produces increasingly weird stuff. But actually, the opposite seems to be the case, both for language and images. The more AI eats its own output, the less variety the output has. For example, in a paper from November, a group of scientists from France tested this for a large language model. They used an open source source model called OPT from Meta and developed several measures for the diversity of language. Then they tested what happens for the diversity of language for tasks requiring different levels of creativity. For example, summarizing a news article requires low creativity, writing a story from a prompt requires high creativity. In this table, they summarize the language diversity scores for the levels of training iteration. As you can see, they pretty much all drop. The language diversity drop is especially rapid for storytelling. A similar finding was made earlier by a group from Japan for AI-generated images based on stable diffusion. The AIs decrease the diversity of the image set, and if you train them on their own output, diversity continues to decrease. You can see this rather clearly in the image sets that they use as examples. These are some examples of real elephant images from the original data set that they use, and these are some examples of the image Images that the AI generated after training. As you can see, they have some of the familiar problems, some legs too many or too few or two heads and some conflation of body parts. But the most striking thing is if you look at a collage. On the left is the sample of the original images, on the right the AI generated ones. You see immediately that the AI generated ones are much more alike. I think that many of us have by now noticed that. If you've been using Midjourney for some while, you have learned to recognize mid-journey-ish images. Even leaving aside the obvious problems that these images continue to have, they tend to output similar looking images. For example, unless otherwise instructed, people tend to be white, young and good looking. These are four images that Midjourney created when prompted with human face photorealistic, without further instructions. As you can see, they all look more or less the same. What are the consequences? Well, no one really knows. The issue is that our entire environment is basically being contaminated by AI-generated content and since there's no way to identify its origin, it'll inevitably leak into training data. It's like plastic pollution. It won't be long until we all eat and breathe this stuff. There are two ways things can go from here. One is that it turns out that this is a general problem which can't be overcome with these types of models, in which case, well, good news for humans, our creation creativity will still be needed. It also seems likely to me that AI-generated content will have to be marked as such. I suspect that this is where laws will take us. The other way it could go is that the next generation of AIs will remedy this problem by deliberately enforcing variety, for example by making more use of randomness, and that we'll simply give up trying to distinguish AI-generated content from human-generated content. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. What do we want? Better memory. When do we want it? What? 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 Joking aside, I have a two terabyte hard disk and used to think that's a lot. Then I bought a new video camera and it's clocked my disk in no time. 
And yes, that's cloud storage, but you know, it's not actually in the clouds. They still store it on something down on Earth. And besides that, it would take me forever to upload. So I was thrilled to see this recent paper in Nature about a new optical storage method that could bring disk memory into the petabyte range. Petabytes. That's a thousand terabytes. Let's have a look. The new technology is an old technology. It's optical storage. Some of you may even be old enough to remember optical storage. We used to carry music around on those things called compact discs. And let me just say you had to walk very carefully if you didn't want to listen to the same sentence a thousand times. Later, we put movies on these things called DVDs. We now have a neighbor who's hung her old DVDs up on the balcony to scare off the pigeons. True story. These compact discs were usually made of some kind of plastic with a coating which gave them their shiny appearance. They worked by using a laser to burn the information into the coating and then read it out again. Actually, a pretty nice idea, quite straightforward. Why did compact discs die? They were outcompeted by hard drives that can store information packed much more densely. The information density on compact disks or any optical storage is ultimately limited by the frequency of the laser light. For visible light, that's a few hundred nanometers. In modern flash drives, the information is stored in little magnetizable cells that are just a few atoms in size and can be as small as 10 nanometers or so. They can store much more data in the same space, hence the death of compact disks. But maybe they'll soon make a comeback, because in this new work, a group of researchers from China figured out how to write data in multiple layers on a disk with lasers and read them out again. They say this could work up to hundreds of layers, which would be a huge increase in memory capacity. They say that a single disk of this type could store as much as a petabit. Yes, a bit is the same as a byte, but then this was only a prototype. They also envision that in data centers, the disks could be stacked into arrays that could each hold exabits. Sounds good, but just exactly what did they do? This new work is really a combination of several advances. Partly, they made it work because they have a synthetic material that can be modified in a very targeted way by changing how its polymers are linked. They can write at a certain depth in the material by focusing the laser on one particular spot. They actually use two lasers, one that initiates the change of the molecular property of the disk and the second that terminates it, leaving behind an altered region. This region can later be read out by causing it to emit light with yet another laser, and that can then be detected. So to write, you locally change the property of the material with lasers. To read, you cause it to emit light. The other advancement that they make use of is that this two-laser method also allows them to encode structures below the wavelength of the lasers. This also makes it possible to pack the data more densely. I guess it also helps that they were working with a femtosecond laser that prevents them from melting the entire disk to a pool of goo before they're done working with it. Writing to and reading data from the disk actually works very nicely, as you can see in this video. What you can see here is a scan through the layers. They have alternatingly encoded the acronyms of their institute and the university, and you can see that they are pretty clearly readable. The distance between two layers is just about one micrometer, so you could pack 1,000 of them into a millimeter. That said, there is some way to go from there to commercialization. First and most importantly, when it comes to storing data, it's not just the density of the storage that matters, it also matters how quickly you can write the data and read it out. They didn't say anything about that, but I assume since this is a prototype, it's fairly slow. Then there's the question how much energy that takes and also where do you get a femtosecond laser from? 
Then again, you know, this entire area of technology is currently evolving so quickly. These challenges might be possible to overcome given a few years' time. So who knows, maybe compact disks will make a comeback in the not-too-far future. And inevitably, the day will come when we'll all record our entire life in 8K I can't wait for it. I'm convinced that it won't be long until a computer program will reach human level intelligence and also become conscious. But I don't think we're quite there yet. Let's have a look at what happened this week that got everyone's circuits overheated. The reason I think it's basically certain that computer programs will become conscious is that there's nothing special going on in neurons that can't be reproduced on a computer. It's just that the brain has a starting advantage of some billion years of evolution and that includes a lot of hardwired function. Other than that, it's basically biological machine learning before that was cool. But eventually technological evolution will catch up to bioevolution. It's just a question of time and enough GPUs to cause a global crisis, but that's another story. This week we had some new reports saying that a computer program supposedly became self-aware. The AI in question is Claude 3. That's the newest AI from Anthropic. The company reports that their new AI in the Pro version ties with GPT-4 in terms of common knowledge, but has software developers salivating over it because it's much better at writing code. Reportedly, while the researchers were testing the model, Claude remarked that it seems like it's deliberately been put to test. It did also, when asked to write about its own situation, write a story about an AI whose consciousness awakens. Ooh, meta. Are these really signs of self-awareness? Quite possibly, the reason it wrote a story about AI becoming conscious is that this is how these stories normally go. AI becomes self-aware. Dissonant violence. Will Smith punches some robots? You know the drill. The test in question was what's called a needle in a haystack test, in which the models fed a huge bulk of literature with one weird sentence that doesn't fit. It's later been asked a question that requires this one sentence. In this case, the haystack was text about programming and the needle about pizza toppings. Claude not only found the needle, it also remarked that it suspects the pizza topping fact was inserted as a joke or to test if it was paying attention. Does that signal self-awareness? Well, the insertion of random sentences in big box of text is not that uncommon among PhD candidates who want to find out whether their supervisor is even reading the thesis. It seems quite possible to me that Claude has some stories about precedents in its training data. This isn't the first time someone has been freaked out by the response of an AI. Already in 2022, we had someone at Google claiming their large language model was sentient because that's what its text output set. And it's going to happen again. But the problem is, there's no way to tell whether someone or something is conscious based on the output alone. We may not have an agreed upon theory of consciousness, but what we agree on is that it happens inside the brain. So eventually AI researchers will have to find a way to measure what's going on inside the AI while it's thinking. I have to say that honestly, I don't find the question all that interesting. I mean, you don't really care whether I'm conscious, do you? So what are we to make of Claude? I guess by now everyone has their own favorite test for AIs. Personally, I like to ask them to explain Bell's theorem. They all get it wrong because they can't actually do maths and most of the text about Bell's theorem is wrong. It actually makes such a good test that I'm almost glad now that there have been so many wrong explanations of Bell's theorem. Claude 3 didn't fare any better than GPT-3-5. They both erroneously claimed that Bell's theorem has something to do with realism, an assumption that clearly isn't in the maths. Google's Gemini, interestingly enough, didn't make that mistake. These were all the free versions. If you find that one of the pro versions gets Bell's theorem right, let me know and I'll sign up in no time. What does civilization mean to you? To me, the most essential part of civilization is shelter. Yes, YouTube comes a close second, of course. But on top of the list, I want to have a safe, dry, warm place to live. And it's not just me.
Residential heating plays a special role in people's lives in countries where temperatures outside frequently get a little uncomfortable. But most buildings are currently heated with gas and oil. Globally, the carbon dioxide emissions from residential heating make up 10 to 12 percent or so, though they strongly depend on the season. This is why a lot of governments have pushed their people to install heat pumps. At least where I live, those have not been particularly popular so far. But this might change soon because a major upgrade to the technology is now hitting the market and it's really good news. Let's have a look. A heat pump is basically a type of electric heating. It uses electricity to move heat from one place to another against the direction the heat naturally flow. Your freezer, for example, also uses a type of heat pump. It pumps warm air out of the pizza and into your room. And an air conditioner is also a heat pump. It pumps warm air out of your room and into your neighbor's garden. Heating with a heat pump works the same way, but in the other direction. It pumps heat into your house by making the outside cold. Colder. Or maybe one could say that it pumps cold out of your house. Guys, I've now been thinking about this sentence for a full hour. Does it make sense to speak of moving around cold as the negative of moving around heat? Please chime in below. There are three major types of heat pumps. The simplest one uses air from next to the house. But you can also use a water reservoir if you have one or air from deeper underground. This has the advantage that the temperature is usually more stable down there, but it requires drilling. Either way, you can use the heat pumps to warm up the air in your house or the water that you use for heating. What's the point? The point is that a heat pump is very energy efficient, basically because it just sorts heat rather than creating it. Exactly how much carbon dioxide is released in the operation of a heat pump depends on how you power it. But if you go by energy, it's half to a third of a typical fossil fuel heating. That's why most countries have pushed house owners to install heat pumps. And that partly worked. Heat pumps are on the rise internationally and in some countries it's been going well. Sweden, Norway and Finland lead the way in adoption with 40% of house households using heat pumps already and in the United States it's about 15%. But in other countries the uptake has been very slow. In Europe we have the UK at the bottom of the list with less than 1% and Germany isn't doing much better with about 2%. The problem with heat pumps is that they have limits below what some of us are used to from civilization and that makes us uncomfortable. Why is that? Well, you've probably noticed that no matter how long you run your freezer, it doesn't reach a temperature of absolute zero. That's because your freezer isn't entirely airtight, because the container walls also conduct heat, and because the efficiency of the cooling cycle decreases the larger the temperature difference between the inside and outside. This means for our practical purposes, your freezer has a minimum temperature that it can reach. It's the same with those heat pumps just that they have a maximum temperature that they can reach and the larger the temperature difference you want to have, the less well they'll work. With the heat pumps that have been on the market so far, it's been really difficult to reach temperatures above 50 degrees Celsius, especially in the winter. Now you might say you don't want your room at 50 Celsius anyway, and I hear you, but the typical water cycle heating that most houses have with fairly small heating elements use temperature temperatures between 50 and 90 degrees Celsius. That's because if the heating elements are small, you need them to be really hot. You can make do with lower temperatures if you heat larger areas instead. This is why heat pumps are often used together with floor heating. That way the temperature doesn't have to be that high. But the floor heatings themselves are expensive and then the insulation of your house also matters for them to work well. I believe these are the major reasons why in some countries countries heat pumps have been slow to catch on. They work well in new houses, but many old houses are not well insulated enough for those pumps to indeed heat them. If you walk through a typical residential street in the UK, for example, you'll see lots of brick houses. 
houses, many of them with wood-framed windows. A heat pump just won't get them warm, and they're a nightmare to insulate. Even if you insulate them, that causes other problems, for example with humidity. I suppose that's why the infamous British-born activist group Extinction Rebellion now has a splinter group which calls itself insulate Britain. I really admire the change of direction there. They went from raging against human extinction right to, excuse me, is it possible that we could get some state aid to retrofit our brick walls? The issue with old houses in Germany isn't quite so pressing because a lot of those were bombed down during the Second World War. However, heat pumps aren't popular here for other reasons. The first is that they're expensive even with the support you get from the government. And that electricity is also expensive in Germany. Also, heat pumps make noise because you need to, well, run that pump. And then there's the issue that most house owners know that heating trends come and go. And I guess they figure they'll just sit it out. At least that's what I was thinking. However, it doesn't look like the heat pump trend is going away. Rather, it's just getting started. The reason is that a new generation of heat pumps has just come on the market and they really make a difference. They use a new refrigerant, that's the stuff which transports the heat, called R290, which is a type of propane. This much increases heat pump efficiency. These new heat pumps reportedly reach temperatures up to 7 degrees Celsius, which is comparable to what your oil or gas heating delivers. Even better, the R290 refrigerant is one that doesn't damage the ozone layer when it escapes. The idea itself is not new, it's been around for years, but it wasn't until last year that it hit the consumer market big time. Lots of companies are now selling the new heat pumps. Mitsubishi, for example, has declared R290 the future of home heating, LG agrees, Panasonic is on it too. These things are all over the place. The praise of R290 is pretty much universal. I've tried to dig up criticism, but the only thing I found is that R290 is extremely flammable, which is not great, seeing that the most common problem with heat pumps is that they leak. Then again, these pumps don't contain a huge lot of the stuff, so I guess the risk is tolerable. That said, using propane doesn't remove the problem that heat pumps need more energy the higher the temperature difference you want them to create. This means that while you could use the new heat pumps to reach water temperatures above 70 degrees Celsius, the relevant question is whether that's any better than just heating with electricity. I guess we'll find out soon. The potential of these heat pumps is huge. A recent study found that in the United States alone, heat pumps could save between one and two thirds of carbon emissions from the residential sector. That's between five and nine percent of the national emissions. That's a big chunk. So I think that's a good development and it could make a real difference in principle. In practice, the company which owns our house isn't even fixing our half broken oil heating. So I don't think we'll see any heat pump here soon. I hope that Insulate Britain is doing better than that. 85% of matter in the universe is dark matter, astrophysicists say, which might make you wonder what all this stuff is doing. I mean, some of the matter in the universe has learned to walk and talk. So why is dark matter so boring? In case you've been wondering too, astrophysicists now say that some of this dark matter might form stars, sort of, which can explode, sort of. Let's have a look. This video comes with a quiz that lets you check how much you remember. Dark matter is one of the explanations that astrophysicists have come up with to explain numerous anomalous observations they've been making during the past century. It basically seems like the pull of gravity is stronger than it should be, though this becomes noticeable only on large scales. Galaxies rotate faster than they should, galaxies and clusters move too fast, gravitational lenses are too strong. The hypothesis of dark matter has it that this happens because there is more stuff in galaxies and galaxy clusters, it's just that we can't see it. The alternative explanation is that the law of gravity doesn't work as we think it does. Of these two hypotheses, dark matter is currently the more popular one. We know very little about dark matter, if that exists, which it may not. That's because to explain observations, dark matter just needs to be dark and matter and not clump too much. Featureless stuff, 
fits the bill just fine. However, particle physicists like the idea that it's some kind of particle, and they have come up with all kinds of ideas for just what that particle could be. There are wimps and machos and macros and all kinds of supersymmetric particles and massive gravitons and whatnot, though there's no evidence any of those actually exist. The new paper is about one of those particles, called an axion-like particle. Axions were first proposed in the late 1970s to make the standard model of particle physics somewhat prettier. Yes, they are named after a washing detergent because they were supposed to, you know, wash away what particle physicists considered to be a blemish in the laws of nature that's a constant whose value they don't like because they think it's too small. Unfortunately, if axions existed, they'd be emitted in large numbers from neutron stars, and the neutron stars would cool very quickly. By 1980, it was clear that observations were just incompatible with the existence of axions. After that happened, physicists came up with various amendments to the original axion hypothesis that would make the particle more difficult to detect. So not only was the axion invented for an unscientific reason, it was to make a perfectly fine theory prettier, but after it had been ruled out, particle physicists made it even more unscientific by amending a theory that didn't explain anything. These new types of axions have now grown into an entire arm called axion-like particles, and there are dozens of experiments looking for those particles. They continue to not find them. But about the paper, if dark matter exists, which it may not, and if it's made of these axions, and if these axions have the right masses and right interactions, then they can condense to form compact objects called solitons. This is because axions are a type of particle called boson, and bosons can undergo Bose-Einstein condensation. Yes, it's Albert again. This means that given the right circumstances, axions just lump onto each other. They clump, basically. The idea has been around for around 10 years, and those axion clumps have been called axion stars. They don't look anything like our stars, though, because they don't do nuclear fusion. There are no nuclei to fuse there. Further calculations then show that if the axion stars get too big, they become unstable. And if they become unstable, they could explode. And if they could explode, that could release radiation, which would heat up the gas in the vicinity of the axion star. And that might be observable. And this is what they looked at in the new paper. They asked if those axion stars were produced in the early universe and they exploded, what did this have done to the gas? Because that could still be observable today. They looked at CMB data and didn't find any evidence of axion star explosions. As it's a common habit among physicists, this isn't called a negative result, but an interesting constraint. And also in line with physicists' habits, they then say that a next generation of experiments might be able to find the missing evidence. This next generation of experiments are various planned radio telescopes that will be looking for old hydrogen emissions which might come from the gas that might have been affected by the axion stars. This type of experiment has become known as 21 centimeter astronomy because this hydrogen emission line is today approximately of the wavelength of 21 centimeters. 21 centimeter astronomy is basically the next big thing in astronomy, and that's why the current game of theorists is to make predictions for those experiments. Okay, let's sum it up. If dark matter exists, which it may not, and if it's made of axions, for which there's no reason, and if these axions form stars, and if these stars have the right properties to explode, and if the axions couple strongly enough to release photons, then that could leave some observable traces in the interstellar gas that could probably also be caused by many other astrophysical effects. The most interesting part is that people still get paid for this. The web address ending .ai stands for Angular. And Angular, as everyone knows, is an island in the Caribbean and a former British colony. But how did another tiny island by name Tokelau end up as the country with the second highest number of website registrations in the world? Let's have a look.
The endings of web addresses like .com.org.us and so on are known as top-level domains. They are managed by many different institutions known as the registry of the domain. We usually don't pay all that much attention to top-level domains, but they contain a lot of information. The most common top-level domain is .com. These are managed by the company called VeriSign, which sits in Virginia in the United States. If you register a domain, you don't don't directly do this with the registry. You do it through a third party known as a registrar. That's usually your internet provider like GoDaddy or Strato or something like that. They make the registration on your behalf. So you, the registrant, pay something to the registry and a little extra to the registrar. All these registries are assigned and overseen by ICANN, that's the Internet Corporation for Assigned Numbers and Names. VeriSign, which manages .com, also oversees .net, .gov and .edu. The latter two, .gov and .edu, however, you can only request as a governmental institution in the US or as an educational institution, respectively. Some other countries also have top-level domains reserved for the government. For example, .gov.uk is the the official domain of the British government. What I didn't know until last week is that all two-letter domains are country domains. Each of these country domains is managed by a designated institution within the respective country. For example, .uk is managed by Nominate in the United States. .us is managed by the American Registry for Internet Numbers. .de is managed by DENIC in Germany and so on. The interesting thing is that many people, like me, don't know that two-letter top-level domains are all country domains. This fact is so little known that some top-level domains have become popular in certain business sectors, like Angulas.ai for AI startups or Italy's.it for anyone to do with information technology. In the broadcast and podcast business, the endings .am and .fm have spread, referring to the common abbreviations for amplitude modulation and frequency modulation. You may know this from Riverside.fm. But what does it stand for? FM are the Federated States of Micronesia, that's more islands, and .am, that's Armenia. Cape Verde has become popular to put up a CV. The island of Tuvalu attracts anyone to do with TV and the Republic of Djibouti is the go-to for DJs. Who can buy a top-level domain in any specific country depends on the registrar who's tasked with overseeing them. This has had some funny consequences. If you look at the list of most widely used country code top-level domains by last year, then on the very top of the list there is CN, which is China. That makes sense, because after all, China is a big country. But what the heck is TK? TK stands for Tokelau. Tokelau is, you guessed it, another island, this one in the South Pacific Ocean, north of New Zealand. Tokelau has a population of about 1,500 inhabitants. When country code top-level domains became available in 1997, no one in Tokelau had any idea what to do with them. They gave the rights to a Dutch company by name Freenum, which also manages a few other country code domains. Freenum sold the .tk domains for free, presumably making money with related services such as also selling off the .com domain or asking for money after some period had passed. They didn't exactly ask for a lot of information about whoever was registering the domain. This made .tk domains very popular among those who move their websites frequently. And this is how the tiny island of Tokelau became infamous as the to-go place for fishers, scammers and anyone doing illegal deals. Freenum was technically obliged to remove domains that had been reported to violate laws within a certain period of time, but all too often they didn't. Early last year, Meta sued them for it. In November 2023, ICANN terminated its accreditation agreement with Freenum. On February 12th this year, Freenum announced that it had settled the lawsuit with Meta under undisclosed terms and that it had exited the domain name and registry business. And I am now very tempted to register a website in St. Helena. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.